Hello everybody, good evening, welcome here at the Luxembourg lecture, the presentation of the study. I'm very happy to welcome you here at the Circular House, a Berlin-based Berlin center for circular economy practices. My name is Katalin Genburg. I'm a member of the parliamentary group of Die Linke in the Berlin Parliament and I'm responsible for city development and tourism and smart city. So today I will do, I will do the moderation and um, we are here to listen to a lecture about the new study of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, um, the future of our cities is the title of the evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you, all of you, there are many, many people here, and uh, as well the two day speakers, Yevgeny Morozov, Morozov sorry, and um, Andre Holm, who will do the um, comment on the lecture, and as well Francesca Bria. Yevgeny Morozov is one of the most prominent critics of digital ca uh, capitalism and author of several books. He writes for various new newspapers, amongst others, the new, new York Times, The Economist, The Guardian, and Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Not anymore. Not anymore, he tells me now. Okay. <laughs> he is preoccupied with questions of how major technologies, companies, and uh, are transforming society and democracy. Andre Holm is a well-known leftist city researcher and teaches at Humboldt University in Berlin. He is a well-known left activist as well, working in the field of gentrific gentrification studies, housing policy, and urban development. He also works as an ad advisor for the parliamentary group of Die Linke in the Berlin Parliament. Before we listen to the lecture of Yevgeny and the comment of Andre, and as well uh, part of the lecture of, yeah, yeah, I will do the introduction, don't worry, um, of, uh, by Andre. I want to mention that this lecture today is the first presentation of the study Rethinking uh, Smart City, How to Democratize Urban Infrastructures. Francesca Bria, now that's the part, <laughs> who is also here, is uh, the Digital Innovation Officer at the City Government of Barcelona. She and Yevgeny Morozov uh, did the study together. The study was financed and commissioned by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. And for those who don't know the Rosa Luxemburg <laughs> Stiftung, it is important to say that it is uh, associated to the left party Die Linke and works on social ana analysis and political education. Let me now just add some personal words. I'm very happy that we are here today and able to discuss alternative visions of the future of our cities in the era of digital capitalism and the era of the digital, the so-called digital revolution. Three years ago, we had the first event together with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation about left critics of the smart city paradigm and only a few people were there maybe not, uh, not even 100. Last year, I had the big honor to meet Francesca Bria <laughs> at a panel about smart, city, smart cities. And she said, look, it's good that you have a very theoretical point of view on your critics about what smart city is about and why it is so bad and capitalistic and whatever. But look around in Berlin, there are so many activists come together with them and just organize yourself and find a practical initiative to confront the smart city paradigm. So here we are and 
Yeah, now let's just listen to the lecture and then afterwards we will have one hour to debate. Not, maybe not everybody <laughs> of us, but we will find a solution to um, make a lot of you come um, uh, to have a word in the discussion. So, Yevgeny, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much. And Thank you very much also for introducing me half correctly. Usually I'm introduced completely wrong. So yeah. usually when I do events that are not organized by Delinge or by Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, I'm introduced as a critic of technology. Uh, here I got introduced as a critic of digital capitalism, which I think gets us very close to how I think of myself. But I would like to disabuse us of any uh, idea of any notion that somehow there is a separate thing out there called digital capitalism driven by its own dynamics and driven by its own logic that lies outside of the capitalist system as such. Right? Uh, which I think is a very important point to make and I'm not just joking here, I'm trying to nitpick on uh, a tiny point because what I would like to argue and leave you with tonight is that much of what we hear about smartness, digitality, and so forth, um, it does presume that somehow we have broken away from all of the other dynamics that have driven life and the urban environment up till now. And up till now, of course, that dynamic has primarily been financial, has been driven by the interests of real estate, has been driven by interests of developers, by investment management houses, asset managers, and so forth. Right? I would like to argue that even though that logic increasingly manifests itself through digital technologies, data extractivism, data accumulation, smart technologies, and we'll talk about all of them later tonight. Primarily the actors that shape the development of cities have not changed so much. There are new intermediaries, but I wouldn't necessarily discount uh, and somehow uh, downgrade uh, the role that we have traditionally attributed to the uh, real estate industry or to the finance industry in the determining what happens in our cities. And the alliance between the financial part and the digital part is much stronger than many of us recognize. Right? So let's not just think about the digital outside of the financial. Right? So point number one. But to return to the study, which I think is a study that all you should download and read, and there are copies available there in German, and as far as I know, there will also be copies soon, not now, but soon, available in English, uh, online, and uh, I don't know if they'll be available on paper, but uh, nonetheless, the report itself uh, consists of two parts. Uh, one is more of a theoretical, analytical part that tries to situate uh, the emergence of this interest in smartness in cities in the dynamics of contemporary capitalism with the focus on neoliberalism and financialization and many of the other dynamics that you're all familiar with. And the second part uh, is much more pragmatic uh, and looks upon and considers what it is that can be done. What are some of the forms of interventions that can happen? Uh, what role can be played by social movements that have traditionally resisted many of the dynamics uh, that we are describing? Uh, and also, what are some of the interventions in terms of public policies uh, at the level of the city uh, that can be implemented? You could probably guess that uh, Francesca contributed much more to the second part, I contributed much more to the first part, so I will, will probably split uh, somewhat the task tonight. Um, I would focus on the kind of macro level picture, as I see it, of how the trends that we now see in cities, uh, when it comes to digital technology, relate to some broader dynamics of the capitalist system, uh, and I'll try not to make it too boring. Uh, and then Francesca will, of course, give you the real-world perspective of what can actually be done about them. So the task is really uh, not very ambitious for her. Um, no, I'm joking. I'll also try to explain what it is that we can do, but I'm sure she'll give you much more concrete uh, information to chew upon. Uh, so one of the main uh, departing points, if you will, and one of the main assumptions uh, that uh, drive this study and the approach that we take in this study is that we should not get particularly hanged up and particularly picky uh, about this term smart. Right? So uh, it is true that it's a term that has emerged as a term that many technology firms and consulting firms have found very convenient 
roughly a decade ago to pitch their services to the industry. Uh, that generated a lot of critiques from people who clearly saw through a lot of the marketing brochures of those firms. Uh, up to a point where now, a decade into it, I can easily imagine a future where that term will just drop out of circulation. Right? And we will not have brochures dedicated to the smart city, and we will not have conferences dedicated to the smart city, while the reality and many of the initiatives that were started under that uh, cover, if you will, will continue. Right? So I think we should not necessarily uh, draw very clear demarcation marks and points and boundaries about what counts as a smart city or smart city initiatives and what doesn't. We'd rather look at more or less functional level, what it is that this smartness behind many of these initiatives and projects, what does it actually imply, right? And what it is that the people pitching this proposals, solutions, and uh, initiatives, what do they want to accomplish, right? So this is one part. And the other part, of course, is to ask uh, what is it that drives those initiatives, right? Why do city managers, city administrators, uh, people making many of these deals with technology companies, why do they find these proposals appealing? Why do they find them uh, somehow feeding into the broader agenda, whether that agenda is of enforcing austerity measures, or whether it's an agenda of democratizing participation or something else entirely? Uh, the dynamics that we are likely to uncover will be dynamics that cannot be easily brought back to a single logic, right? So what I would like to argue here is that this push towards smartness itself, right, it's driven by logics that uh, have to be unpicked uh, almost sector by sector and feature by feature. And I know that it sounds very abstract and I'll, I'll try to make it more concrete as we speak, but I think it's very important to understand that there is no one uh, self-propelling logic of smartness that requires cities to do certain things. No, they're picked up uh, by city managers and administrators who have particular needs, right? Some of those needs might have to do with building more energy efficient systems. Some of them might have to do with balancing their budgets. Some of them might have to do with presenting themselves as being in the avant-garde of creating uh, highly competitive uh, urban economies that investors would appreciate and so forth. Right? So those motivations and rationales are very different in, in, in many different cases, even though very often they are lumped uh, under this label uh, SMART. And I will uh, get back to that in some more detail. Um, to give you an example of how the latest and future generation of projects that interact with technologies and data in the urban setting would not even be using this terminology, it's enough to look at what a company like Google has been doing in this space. So those of you who have been watching this uh, for quite some time would know that uh, roughly three years ago, Google formed a unit uh, called Sidewalk Labs where they uh, put a very prominent um, executive, uh, Daniel Doktorov, who had a career on Wall Street uh, before in private equity, but then went to work for Michael Bloomberg. Uh, they put him as uh, vice mayor for uh, economic development. Uh, they put Daniel Doktorov in charge of Sidewalk Labs, and the goal of Sidewalk Labs, actually, is to fix cities, or to solve cities. Right? solve problems that exist in cities, even though they wouldn't even mind saying that the goal is to fix cities. Uh, and that means, in practice, that it's all about finding ways to apply many of Google's technologies, from self-driving cars, uh, to uh, automated parking systems, uh, to ways in which uh, you can offer uh, all sorts of public services to optimize energy use, to heat up, as they proposed in one of the recent uh, submissions to the city of Toronto, to propose even heating pavements so that you can melt snow while people get to work on their bicycles. Right? There are quite a lot of things that uh, Google is capable of doing, leveraging uh, the great uh, ecosystem, to use their word, of sensors and data gathering devices that they have assembled so far. Right? They specifically do not use the term the smart city or smart in describing any of the initiatives. Right? Nonetheless, uh, as you would see if you examine their many page, 100 pages of proposal that they submitted to the city of Toronto, to build an entire 
part, an entire district of the city from scratch, and they won that proposal, by the way, a couple of months ago, uh, you would see that they have an ambitious vision where they will actually be the key intermediary to the provision of many services uh, that will be offered by the city itself. Well, it will be offered by the city, but of course it will be offered by Google, so it will be offered in the city, to put it more exactly, but it will be more or less overtaken by uh, this company. Right? So, again, I think the, uh, the message that I keep on insisting is that we should not draw this explicit demarcating lines. Right? We have to be looking at what technology companies and other companies are doing with technology and data in cities. Right? Uh, some of that would fit under the smart city rubric, some of that would not. Right? And I think if we were to analytically split uh, everything that's happening in cities with regards to technology and data uh, and with regards to this kind of smartness imperative or rationale into three broad categories, uh, we can roughly say that the rationales are three, of three kinds. Right? Uh, it's uh, in one way uh, to promote automation, to promote reputation, if you will, and I'll explain what it is, and to promote allocation. Right? So this panoply, this network of digital devices, sensors, uh, and uh, networks, it serves to uh, kind of work on these three dimensions, right? So it seeks to automate better, and here you can think about artificial intelligence, which is what essentially drives self-driving cars, penetrating almost every facet of society, right? From transportation to energy use to public health to many other domains. Right, so the goal is not just to automate by injecting some kind of artificial intelligence into every service, but it's also clearly to make services cheaper. Right? And that's essentially the rationale uh, that uh, Google uses when they pitch their services to a lot of city administrators. That the idea is that many of the services that previously were inefficient and ineffective can now be offered cheaper if only you let Google in and help you optimize your traffic flows by analyzing how all the cars are navigating the city. Or if you will just let them in in order to uh, take over the provision of you know, public transportation system or to build the last mile of the public transportation system. To give you another example, in uh, the United States, where many local um, governments and local municipalities find themselves uh, under heavy budgetary constraints because of austerity and uh, many similar factors, um, many of them actually opt to offer a subsidy to Uber so that the rights of their own citizens in that particular town, in that particular uh, municipality are actually cheaper instead of building their own transportation system. Right? So actually already half towns in New Jersey, towns in uh, Florida, which instead of building or investing and maintaining uh, their own system of buses or trains, are actually offering subsidies to Uber so that Uber services become 20, 30, or 50% cheaper to the end users. Right? So, and they might become even cheaper to some extent if, Google, if Uber, in this case, manages to completely automate the system and move to uh, and the idea of taxes or transportation services being completely automated uh, and being self-driving, so to say. Right? Which, again, you can see the rationale there that you can actually leverage many of these technologies to automate many of the services, and as you automate, you essentially manage to do more with less. Right? And we all know why there is less. There is less because we are being told that because of austerity agenda, there is far less money to go around, so you have to find a way to end to sort of to, to go on with limited resources, and this is where technology and the rhetoric of smartness and digital comes in very handy. Right? It makes it very easy to justify many of these interventions because a lot of public officials find themselves under quite a lot of pressure, on the one hand, to continue presenting themselves as extremely uh, competitive as compared to other cities, as compared to all the other projects and municipal initiatives that are now undertaking all of these digital technologies. And on the other hand, uh, they need to do all of that with far less resources. Right? So, and, and this uh, interjection of digital technologies, to some extent, is meant to facilitate that. It's meant to uh, have them save their face, to some extent, in that they can present that they are working with big 
capital, with big technology firms, many of them foreign. Uh, they are managing to offer many of the same services they offered before, and they managed to do it cheaper and even better because all of that is digital and all of that costs less. Of course, much of that is untrue in that uh, many of those technologies do not deliver, they do not deliver the savings, they end up subscribing many of those municipalities to contracts, then that uh, end up with municipalities paying far more than they previously expected, but nonetheless, that's the pitch. So that was first pillar, so to say, automation. Uh, reputation systems and, 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 and the idea to leverage this kind of infrastructure of smartness for reputational systems, I think it's so severe important to grasp in that it's primarily uh, a new mechanism of how a society uh, and the city, if you will, uh, that moves away from uh, laws and regulations, when it comes, for example, to zoning regulations, uh, can shift to systems that are driven almost entirely by feedback and collection of information and modification of behavior on behalf of users and whoever happens to be using the platform. In the case of uh, Google's many proposals to cities through sidewalk labs, you can actually see that logic at work. But I would argue that you can also see it at work in many other parts of what we consider to be this new urban digital economy, whether it's Airbnb or Uber, where everybody on the platform has a reputation of some kind. That reputation is always uh, in flux. It's always being updated based on your interactions with other parts of the system. Uh, and that in itself comes to play the role of law and of rules and of regulations that under previous model, actual regulations used to play. So, you know, taxi drivers were obligated to do and not to do certain things uh, through law. Uh, and Uber's pitch was that now we can move away from that and we can actually just have passengers ranking the drivers and that in itself will take care of making sure that they stick to the rules, right? You now can blow that logic to a much broader scale and what we would see with Google's proposals to cities is that they're actually explicitly arguing that we need to move away from zoning requirements uh, and uh, many other pesky regulations that in essence make it much harder for capital to circulate and for new buildings to pop up, whatever investors want them to pop up, to a system where by collecting information and by having and letting everybody rank everybody else, we can have a much more fluid dynamic system where instead of having regulations prohibiting you know, loud music being played at 11 o'clock in a particular part of the neighborhood, you will actually remove all those rules altogether and you will have people providing feedback on whether they're actually okay with that or not. So, and then if you can match it, of course, with a nice Bitcoin operated auction system, you can have perhaps people bidding on whether they would like, uh, how much they would like to pay to tolerate that noise uh, plague in that neighborhood. Right, so I mean, you can see how the logic of dynamic pricing, which you already see at operation in many of these platforms, uh, you know, search pricing in Uber, for example, where whenever there is a natural disaster, prices automatically go up because that's the way to put more demand, um, more supply uh, on the road. You can see that this uh, feedback-driven system tied to a reputation of participants on the platform, uh, it works at the economy at large, of course, not just at the urban level, but in the urban level, it takes a particular importance because very often it is, in fact, tied to things like zoning regulations. Right? And of course, this attack on the regulations and requirements and restrictions, what can be done with urban space, that has also been, of course, the favorite line of attack for the real estate industry and for the developers, who of course have always looked down upon any limitations on what it is that they can do with space, because you know, they would always argue that that actually imposes restrictions on how much houses we can build and so forth. And you can see why Google, for example, itself would insist on such clauses in the uh, city quarters it pitches to cities like Toronto because Google itself will not actually be paying for much of that infrastructure that they're promising to build. Their project essentially is a partnership with big financial players, you know, big real estate guys, who they're still to find, right, who will then come in and contribute the capital to actually build this fantastic cities that Google is promising to operate. They will, of course, operate them, Right? and they will run the data infrastructures, and they will run a lot of other things, but the actual capital-intensive parts of the system, 
buildings, roads, infrastructures, all of that will be funded by someone else. And that someone else, of course, will be none other than a bunch of asset managers, you know, pension funds, and whoever else has money to spare and pour into capital-intensive projects in cities. Right? So again, we're coming back to this um, kind of merger between the financial capitalism on the one hand and the digital one on the other. The third pillar, in addition to this automation and reputation one that I've described, is what I would call allocation. Right? And there, of course, the idea is that by leveraging all the data and all the information and all the feedback that comes from uh, platforms, Uber, Airbnb, our phones, and so forth, social networks, it becomes possible to find new ways to allocate resources that might be scarce uh, or might just be offered at prices that are too rigid and too sticky. So you can think of ways, of course, in which Airbnb has managed to dramatically increase the allocation of houses to some extent, with all sorts of negative and positive consequences for some. Uh, to the same extent, Uber has managed to do the same thing with transportation. And you can see this logic of allocation where you manage to integrate more and more suppliers of things, but also more and more people demanding things through digital technology. You can see that logic at play in many of the platforms that are now kind of invading, if you will, uh, our cities. And I think this idea that you can, through digital technology, you can essentially find ways to use existing resources more efficiently, which of course lies at the heart of capitalist logic as well, right? which is all about increasing your capacity utilization. I mean, this is why you like to have three shifts at a factory and not one, because you don't want to have a factory capacity standing island, idle. Right? Essentially, now we've blown that logic to the rest of society because now it's possible to increase capacity utilization of virtually everything. Right? And that, of course, can be done by reallocating those resources to multiple users dynamically and almost in real time, precisely by the fact that everything is integrated into one big, giant digital market, where everything is interconnected and everything has a reputation of some kind, so you can build markets almost instantaneously. Right? That, of course, is the logic that is at work in society at large, but it's also at work in cities, right? because cities have become very important parts to a project that I describe, and we describe it in the study like this, the project of data extractivism. Right? And I think this logic of data extractivism is something that we are only now beginning to grasp and understand, because ultimately I would argue that this is one of the key uh, poorly understood and mostly invisible processes that currently operate in society at large. And the idea is that you have four or five big, giant, mostly American companies with four or five competitors of similar size in China, more or less pitted against each other uh, in a quest to gather and extract as much data from society as possible in order then to use and convert that data into advanced and quite sophisticated products of artificial intelligence. Right? Which then, of course, allows them to build services on top of that, as you can see in the case of Google self-driving cars, as you can see in the case of many healthcare systems that they're also building with the help of artificial intelligence. I mean, the idea is that once you have AI, you can build very profitable services on top of it. And you have four or five firms, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, you know, and a couple of others that are heavily moving into that space. And as part of this broader logic of that extractivism, of course, they need to find ways to extract as much data as they can. Right? And as part of that data extractivist logic or paradigm, if you will, they find ways uh, in order to expand further and further into our everyday life, because by expanding further and further in our everyday life, they can actually extract more and more data. Right? Which explains to you why Google would like to run everything about what you do, from your car to your bath to your kitchen uh, to your stomach. Where they would like you to swallow pills because that way you will be able to monitor what's happening and collect data and then it will allow you to avoid cancer or whatnot. Right? The idea is that precisely that by expanding the domination, if you will, or the presence of those platforms and their technologies in our life, we'd be able to extract more and more and better and better data, which would not just be used to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of advertising, which is something that we understand by now really well, but also to increase and improve the efficiency of the kind of AI products that they build. Uh, that is also what accounts for many of the heavily subsidized services 
that these firms have been offering to us for the past 10 or 15 years, right? Where we have not been paying almost anything to be using Google services, to be using Facebook services. To some extent, we've not been paying uh, the, the, um, the exact price to Uber for some different reason. So in the study, we actually described this following uh, Colin Crouch as privatized Keynesianism. And there is an entire theoretical discussion uh, which you, know, you can follow in the study, but also outside of the study on what privatized Keynesianism means. But the idea is that you know, up until 2005, 2006, it was mostly private debt and private credit that allowed us, uh, at least those of us in Western Europe and North America, to keep on having decent living standards that people counted upon and relied upon when the economy was stable and we still had actual Keynesianism in place up until 1970s, right? As that system started unraveling, uh, what we have seen was precisely the turn to debt and the turn to credit so that people can actually borrow to finance uh, some of the uh, drops uh, in the living standards, right? And of course, all sorts of rationales were added on top of that. We started investing into houses as a way to supplement our income. Housing became uh, uh, one of the main sources of welfare and security for people. It was pitched so by many parties of the New Labour, for example, in the UK. That was one of their primary actual policies when it comes to welfare. It was to convince everybody that we should all own our houses and then hope that their prices will go up and then sell them. So that's a point that we understand very well. The point we make in the study is that you can actually think of our increasing reliance and dependence on digital technologies from Uber to Airbnb to Google to Facebook and many others along similar lines in that in heavily reducing the costs of social reproduction, if you will, uh, they have allowed us to uh, have compensated Right? for quite a lot of loss in our ability to pay for the services. Right? So if you actually would start factoring in the real cost of using Google or the real cost of using Facebook or the real cost of using many of those platforms, you will end up with people who will just not be able to afford using them. Right? So in some sense, advertising and this, that extractivist logic has paid for the provision of many of the services, but at the same time, uh, you can also see that uh, platforms like Uber and Airbnb that are present in our cities have played a similar role, right? In that they have allowed us, uh, or at least they, how they presented themselves as, to tap into additional sources of income, either by putting those houses that have, we have bought uh, being encouraged by you know, the transformation in the uh, welfare policy, to put it into constant circulation on global markets through Airbnb, or to become uh, essentially um, uh, highly casualized, precarious labor in the case of drivers who drive for Uber, right? So we got access to accessible jobs, but we also got access to making better use of our existing resources. That, of course, then triggers all sorts of negative consequences for the cities that we live in, and you might have noticed it in Berlin, uh, but we also, I also live in Barcelona. We also noticed it in Barcelona, uh, where clearly, Trying to save one part of the population who owns houses has proved somewhat problematic for those who do not own houses and have seen their rents go up as all of those houses are put into circulation for tourists visiting the city. Right? So analyzing a lot of the developments of the digital economy through that lens of privatized Keynesianism I think can be very useful and that's what we do in, in the study. So I would encourage you to just go and look at it in detail. Uh, one last thing to say here is that and I'll pass on to Francesca to ground you in, 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 in somewhat more optimistic, I hope, uh, view of what's happening, uh, is that it's very easy to fall into the trap, which is set up increasingly by big institutions like the World Bank or many consulting firms like Deloitte or McKinsey, that somehow cities and mayors run the world, right? And we should just make sure that all the problems are tackled at the level of the city. In reality, of course, cities are very often are in the hands of McKinsey and Deloitte, and it's them who run the city. So they're more than happy to say that mayors run the world because they're the ones who run the mayors. Uh, right, so if that's the... And I don't uh, work McKinsey. Good, good. Uh, uh, there are exceptions. Uh, but the general reality is quite sad. So what, what I wanted to say was that was not to pick on anybody in particular. What I wanted to say is that we have to understand that, yes, the most immediate... Um, a way for us to act, of course, is at the level of the city, right? And it might be very 
uh, tempting for us to get our hands dirty and start building tools and start building and experimenting with initiatives and all of that. I encourage that and that should be done. But if you take the logic, and of course I presented you only tiny bits of this analysis that we do in the study, but if you take the logic of it to its ultimate conclusion, you will clearly see that there are some structural constraints at the level, not just of the nation state, but perhaps even at the global level, that have forced this logic of digital Keynesianism or privatized Keynesianism, if you will, uh, and this turn towards the smartness in all of its three components of automation, reputation, and allocation on us. Right? And in order to reverse those trends, in order to do something, we also need interventions at the national level, at the global level, which take the question of dominance and artificial intelligence seriously, which take the question of data ownership seriously, which take the question of what kind of industrial future or post-industrial future we'd like to have, and then what role can cities play in it. We cannot just expect, uh, as many of these institutions like the World Bank and others encourage us, that ultimately cities will sort it out if only we put more kind of greener, sustainable, or uh, you know, cooperative technologies uh, at people's use and disposal. You know, the, right of, the rise of a company like Google is the consequence of many, many years of funding by you know, US defense and US trade policy and so forth. We cannot reverse those trends by clever urban policy. It does not mean that there are no things we can do at the urban level, and Francesca, I'm sure, will give you a very good analysis of what ought to be done, but we should not leave this urban fight only to the cities. Right? Uh, even though there are a lot of things that cities can do. Right? And this is where we, we always have to keep balancing this national, global, and the urban scales. Because otherwise we'll just fighting fights which cannot be won by cities, and cities will be the ones who will be blamed for it if they really take up this fight without building ways to kind of branch out of the just urban struggles. Thanks. Francesca, maybe I um, make a, I try to build a bridge. So what is the difference from a left-wing government in Barcelona? What is, is there the possibility to make a difference in this world of um, really dark uh, <laughs> digital capitalism? Thank you. So first, let me say I have the easy task to prevent everybody here to go and commit um, massive suicide, yes? So it's, it's very easy, so I think, um, after this uh, kind of uplifting um, view of the dystopic reality that we're gonna have to live in, in predatory uh, platform capitalism, um, I have the task to say that actually, you know, it's all about our collective power and that it's up to us to actually um, see what can be done. And I really believe that there is that kind of space and that kind of opportunity. And uh, let me say that I totally agree with the last remark that Evgeny made, uh, which is about cities cannot do it alone, and one city, of course, cannot do it alone, but also let's don't give all the responsibility to cities because nation states are retreating from their, um, I mean, from providing some kind of future vision to, to people and also because political and financial institutions are crashing and they do not represent anymore a possibility or a future, I mean, a future world that we want to live in. So I totally agree. But I do think that there is this space of building it from the bottom up where that cities really represent and that an alliance of cities, uh, popular movements, um, social movements, political movements that include political parties and progressive states are needed in order to figure out what we need to do and how to build it together. So um, that's why, you know, in my current job, which I'm the Chief Technology and Digital Innovation Officer of Barcelona, I do also a lot of, I mean, also because, you know, I uh, like to escape a little bit from the Catalonian situation sometime and look at the world and make, you know, alliances. But I go around and talk to a lot of my colleagues in cities and also beyond cities. And, and really debate these kind of issues with the, with, with, with the, um, with the proposition of, why don't we build a different agenda? And I think here, I mean, of course, there is the wake-up call that I think a technology agenda shouldn't be a technocratic agenda. So this is the first, I think, big point 
that it was very clear in what Evgeny says, and there's a wake-up call for our policymakers and our politicians that always leave technology either to the technologists or the, to the technocrats. And actually present the smart city, which is one of the buzzwords, but anyway, one of the big agenda that, we, that are there on the table, as it is for the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, the smart city, I mean, all this technological program as a technocratic program. And usually the technocratic program is about let's leave it to the big tech firms or, or, or the big consultancy firms and so on, and they will tell us you know, what ought to be done and this was the case, I think, for the Smart City program. And this was very much, I mean, done uh, through a technology push, vendor-led agenda, where the big technology firms, I mean, as Evgeny said, mainly uh, big, gigantic US firms, because Europe kind of lost a little bit, um, I mean, hegemony we did, never had, but anyway, lost uh, some kind of leadership in this space. Let's leave them to propose the program. And so this happened. So, you know, technology came first, and basically, I think what is really missing, and where I want to start from, is actually the question of popular sovereignty. So the question of how do, instead of building a uh, predatory uh, digital capitalistic vision, we can uh, create a digital sovereign cities, where the space for popular sovereignty, which actually means um, De democracy, I mean participatory democracy and the ability of people to be part of this, um, of shaping the future of their cities is the very core of what we are doing. So this is actually why I was uh, nominated by the mayor of Ada Colau, the mayor of Barcelona, uh, to be um, in charge of the digital technology policy of the city. And she gave me this very concrete brief that was, how do we design technology that really serve the people? So how do we move away from the technology agenda, which is about you know, hyper-financialization, Uberization, and you know, privatized um, public space into a I mean, thinking about the governance of the technology, the ownership of data, the governance of um, digital infrastructure and digital services that really serve the needs of people. So when I started, you know, my work in Barcelona, it was very pragmatic on this point of, you know, trying to uh, align it with the priorities of the cities, which is the political agenda. For instance, Barcelona had some very clear tasks in our um, city government that is affordable housing. How do we make uh, right to housing, a, a core of our political platform. Our mayor comes from uh, the anti-eviction movement, so she's a housing activist, and so she made housing for everybody uh, a big priority for our government. Then we have the question of energy sovereignty and how we can shift as much as possible to renewable energy production and how cities can re-municipalize re part of the energy infrastructure and energy production. And Barcelona is creating an energy municipal operator and also this actually goes very much aligned with the smart city agenda because smart city is about you know, energy, uh, logistics and digital infrastructure coming together in the provision of urban services. And then, of course, the question of sustainability in general, which is really important about you know, reclaiming public space and make public services more sustainable and so on. And then digital democracy or participatory democracy, that is really one of the things that we are trying to do um, when we formulate policies that I think goes at the core of what we are trying to, we should debate, which is I mean, much less about technology and much more about how do we reshape, I mean, reframe this relationship between public institution and government and people. So what are public institutions designed for? You know, I don't know how, I mean, how much involvement the, the crowd here has with the city policy, I mean, the city of Berlin, how much you are involved into helping them shaping their, I mean, policies in general, not only digital policies, uh, and, you know, how we can redefine this relationship with, um, yeah, between citizens and public institutions. So being inside, you know, I mean, actually in the, in the current government in Barcelona, many of us are not professional politicians. We are citizens, we are in the institutions, trying to change the institutions. We come from, from the outside. I mean, many, many people there from uh, citizen movements and some of us just being, um, you know, like doing our profession and being inside in this, the institutions now and try to change things. And we really realize that part, I mean, big problem is actually the public. 
I mean, how the public is shaped today that doesn't serve at all the needs of, of the citizens. I mean, procedures are very bureaucratic, they're very opaque, it's very hard to know how resources are allocated, where priorities go, how institutions spend the people's money. Uh, which is something really important. And then, you know, it's very hard to get involved. So usually this kind of lobby groups that allocate power, resources, and decides the priorities of the cities are very far removed from what are the real needs of communities. So I think reshaping that kind of relationship and really reframing this agenda as people-led is, is, is the first thing, and it's, it's super important. I think the, the other big question is, um, how do we set the direction of this technological revolution? And I think, yes, I mean, let's forget now if it should, if it should only be done from a city perspective or state or global perspective. I think a big, a, big, a big question is, do we want to go on in a way where the technological revolution, and I mean, honestly, we are seeing a huge transformation. I mean, I, I really believe uh, that the fourth industrial revolution, I mean, if you couple artificial intelligence and the potential of it, I mean, with the big firms, I mean, maybe two or three on the planet that are investing 15 billion uh, US dollars per year, in R&D, which is mainly AI infrastructure, coupled with the possibility of automating manufacturing and automating production, and then outsourcing production again, you know, uh, I mean, in, in East Asia, and, and basically redefining the supply chain. If you look at that, uh, I mean, some economists say this, w this is the first industrial revolution that will destroy more jobs than it creates. I mean, we're talking about 100 million jobs that will be destroyed in, in sector of the economy that are really key to employment creation, you know, like logistics, like transports and, and like manufacturing. So if we look at the magnitude of this, and also, I mean, if we look at unemployment statistics in, in, in Europe, for instance, and Southern Europe, where you have unemployment, I mean, youth unemployment around 40, 50 percent, I mean, you see how much this agenda really requires a political, uh, a political um, vision. I mean, we, we, how, how are we directing this, uh, this technological revolution? For what? I mean, and not only to produce what, but like how? How we're redefining the future of work? You know, how, how all this increase in productivity that will be created for, from, by the fourth industrial revolution, how it will be distributed? Are we going to invest it in a fund, you know, that will provide basic income to people? Or are we creating decent jobs, you know, for the future? So these are how we refine our social provision system systems and so on. So these are all like big questions. And I think, of course, I mean, we need a political agenda to, to address that. And then, you know, what something that we suggest in the study is also the question of technological sovereignty, which of course is not just the question of who controls the technology stacks. I mean, of course, Afghani said it, is if today you don't control um, I mean, even if you don't control microchips, I mean, at this point, you really have to control the entire, uh, I think, technological infrastructure from the cloud to the, um, to the servers, you know, where the data is located. I mean, we see that uh, Europe has lost complete control of data in this economy, and so the majority of the data flies uh, outside, in the, in the US mainly. And you need to control the hardware, you need to control the, um, I mean, the mobile phones, we lost completely uh, control. But mostly, it's not only about software, hardware, and the technology side, or the infrastructure side, but it's the political, of course, the political and economic sovereignty. And I mean, to be um, pragmatic here, at the city level, yes, that we are doing something that is setting a democratic eti ethical standards for the open digitalization, that's how we call it where, for instance, in the city hall, we are introducing clauses in the big contracts that we're doing with uh, technology providers, where we mandate for the use of open standards, we mandate for the use of open source software, interoperability, uh, data sovereignty, which is basically all the time that the cities procure big services, who control the data and the information. So this is a very important part of how the city uh, does procurement and, and spends citizen money. And basically, we are introducing clauses that not only are about um, environmental sustainability, gender equality, and labor standards, but also technological sovereignty, because it's very important that the know-how and the ability to control data and technology stays in the public. And citizens, and this is like a very big point for me, 
are the ones that should control the data. So the data should not belong, I mean, they should not be owned by corporations or by government. It should be owned by us, by the citizens that produce this data. And this should be recognized in the way that we do business, in the way that we do big contracts, and in the way that we develop technologies. And I mean, this is the data sovereignty that should be part not only of a, an ethical and responsible data strategy, but also should be part of the way you know, we develop services and technology. And then of course say that encryption is a human right, and so it should not just be an option. You know, encryption should be, should be there for everybody, for the people, and we should design systems that have privacy and security by design and make this actual GDPR, which is the Data Protection Directive, uh, of Europe a big opportunity for us. I mean, we cannot compete uh, in the digital economy on the basis of what the US government says or what Google says, which is basically surveillance capitalism. We should build an alternative, and this alternative should be about citizen rights, data sovereignty, uh, decentralized architecture, privacy enhancing technologies, and make Europe the heaven of that. I mean, we have a lot of talent. Maybe Berlin is the capital where, you know, we have a lot of hackers that have built a movement <laughs> telling us that this is the kind of technology that we need. Why don't we make this technology the, techno the public technology that citizens can use in the city and we invest public money to develop this technology and that we call all the um, startups and uh, small companies and talent that we have in the city to help cities build this kind of infrastructures. So I think this can be done and it can be done at a city level. Yes, I mean, we are not, and, and, and also this imply a new social pact on data. A new social pact on data means that we also want to have collective rights over data, which is citizen rights over data, which I think are fundamental rights in a digital society. So it's not only about infrastructure, gadgets, tools, and technology. It's really about this kind of social pact that we have to build because this uh, is underlying our you know, rights as citizens in a digital society. And so, yes, we are not going to be able to invest all these billions of euros that are invested by Amazon and all these um, edge funds that we described in the, in the, in the study and that Evgeny was talking about. And it's very hard to arrive at that kind of level of capital. But yes, that we are investing a lot of money in research and development, <laughs> I mean, at least in Europe. And yes, that we have a lot of public funding that can be diverted into this program. And I think it, we have to start from building an alliance with cities, uh, yeah, movements, uh, political parties, and government that want to do this, and that it can be done by repurposing and refocus a lot of the public investment into this kind of technologies. So, yeah, just to to finalize, I think also in the second part of the of the study, and this is something I think it will be nice to discuss tonight. There is a lot that is happening, you know, on like alternatives, you know, platform cooperatives are there, uh, cryptocurrencies now. I mean, not, they are not only used for speculation. I mean, in the financial system, but they're also used to rethink about alternative economic systems locally. I mean, in Barcelona, we have a project that combines cryptocurrency with the basic income for people that need it, and we are piloting that. Uh, we are building decentralized data architectures to give ownership back to um, citizens of their data. Uh, there is projects that are creating alternative economies that are based on this kind of new models. So there is a lot happening. And so what we are also putting out there is, okay, based on what is happening and the collective will that we have, let's move forward to, be, to build these alternatives. Andre from hell to heaven, what, is to ha what has to be done in Berlin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a good question, so, and, and I feel uncomfortable to, to speak after such great presentations and powerful speeches, um, but I have some notes and I will <laughs> read it. So, it, First of all, I'd like to thank to the Royal Luxembourg Foundation for organizing this event and, and also the study and, um, and for inviting Yevgeny and Francesca to Berlin and I think it's a very good idea to start a discussion about a global problem in an international network and, and with, with this amazing partners. At second, I'd like to thank Yevgeny and, and, and Francesca um, for their work and, and you have to read the study. It's, it's, it's an amazing knowledge 
in, in the study and a lot of good ideas and, and uh, especially I like that, that you attempt to translate the critical debates on technology in the right to the city discourse. Yeah? And, 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 and most of you know that I never researched on new technologies and, and I'm using internet but, but never think about it more or less, so I'm an urban researcher and, and, and I know smart city discourses um, from my comrades at, at, in, in the planning associations and, and so. so but um, at first I have to say that, that I agree with most parts of the analysis um, of smart city policies and smart city concepts. Smart cities became, and this is visible after reading your study, a slogan and, and an instrument to promote neoliberal urban policies. and it, one of the central messages of, of your study, so that smart city is less a question of how to use technologies or how to use um, yeah, new technologies, but much more the question um, of the political and economic consequences of, of this new technologies. And, and at least um, you presented it today as well, um, that, that new technologies um, starting a fundamental restructuring of our cities itself. And um, Yevgeny and Francesca are highlighting the complementary um, between austerity, neoliberalism, and smart cities. And they are demonstrating that new technologies cannot be seen as a resource or helpful tool to solve current problems in our city. So that is what um, I learned from, from the study. And it, it's more. And, and, and mode um, of changing social relations and political power structures in our cities and societies. And smart technologies are introduced, are not introduced um, for, for people's benefit in cities at all. And, and, and smart cities much more um, an attempt, especially the, the discussion of um, city governments and smart city networks, yeah, these this discussions um, are much more attempt to make cities ready for the new technologies, yeah, it's, it's not so that, that we have an adoption of, of, of technologies for our need in cities, it's much more my feeling that we change the cities that they are ready for, for the new technologies and or fit much better um, into the new technologies. Digital, digital industries and knowledge-based production, other web-based services became as well a growing segment of capitalist accumula accumulation. Um, during the last years, Google, Amazon, Apple, IBM are one of the most powerful um, companies in the world today. And therefore, it is not a surprise that they have an interest to reconstruct our cities um, into or as, as infrastructures and consumer space of, of their um, economic activities at, at least. And it is not the first time that was my thinking about this, this, this phenomenon that urban and regional planning strategies were subordinated under the requirements of a basic technology. Yeah, the urbanization and, and, and the railways in the area of, of early industrialization achieved the need of heavy and steel industry and, and, and based on the steam engine technology, the suburbanization and highway construction in the last century um, followed the needs of the automobile industry and, and at, at, at least it, it's the same um, construction between basic technologies and, 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 and cities. Yeah? And of course each era are, are, are different from, from the era before. Cities are not only providing spatial conditions and physical infrastructure for the particular mode of production, but furthermore the best social structure for accumulation. So this is what we learned from the past. And mass worker societies, including the army of unskilled workers in the time of industrialization, as well as the nuclear families in the suburban um, cities um, during the fordist mode of production could understand as a necessary social structure for social composition for each mode of accumulation. And this is an approach of the um, regulatory theory, regulations theory. Um, Regulation school, yeah. That is what I mean, post-Marxist um, <laughs> regulation school. And this, this series complemented the analysis of capitalist accumulation um, by analysts of a dominant way of regulating societies. And the example of the Fordist mass production, 
redistribution in the context of Keynesian welfare policy, the nuclear families and suburban settlements is one of the best examples for this triangle between accumulation, regulation, social structure based on um, basic technology. And, 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 and this was my way to, to interpret um, the, the new situation or the discussion um, about smart cities and the coincidence of digitalization, neoliberalization, individualization you pointed out in your study is giving a clue for the regulatory triangle of the 21st century maybe, the digital infrastructure, gentrified cities with high-skilled, um, individualized and flexible workers in it um, are becoming the spatial and social conditions um, for the new mode of accumulation and smart city policies in this terms could be seen as a forerunner of coming, coming modes of, of regulation. So this, this was um, what, what I learned from, from the study. And, and especially in the history of capitalist urbanization, um, the last 150 years are showing that new technologies are not established to solve problems in cities, but that policies are intended to adapt cities to new technologies and new modes of accumulation. And David Harvey, um, a critical geographer from the US, pointed out that urban and regional structures and the social relation in the cities itself as a basic infrastructure for capitalist accumula accumulation and, and, and therefore we should not only discuss about the infrastructure of, 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 of the worldwide net and the technological side of infrastructures but, but especially our um, social relations in the city are became a part of this new um, yeah, precondition for um, capitalist accommodation and therefore it should be a common point to interpret digital technologies and especially smart city policies at first as an attack on cities as we know them yeah? and, and, and we, we, we should discuss this, this attack and, and, uh, under or, or in, in, in two direction it, it's also attacking parts of the city we don't like but um, what we learn in, 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 in many conflicts in Berlin is that, that, that new technologies and especially smart city policies are um, in force a lot of problems we, we, we still have in, 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 in Berlin and, and based on this consideration we have to analyze the main actors by this attack and we have to find out who will benefit from these changes and who will be losing something and, and as at, at least every economic change and also every change of technological paradigm um, will be also a kind of social redistribution in it. And Givgeni and Francesca are highlighting some of the companies are benefiting from the digital change um, of production and communication. On the one hand, all providers or most providers of digital infrastructure. On the other hand, providers of new services, so like Uber, Zalando, Airbnb. And overall, there is a benefit for financial institutions. This is what Evgeny pointed out in his speech and enabling new infrastructures and new services. And the digital economy seems deeply embedded into the financial financialization of investment. So, and, and this was also new for me as an only yeah, consument of, 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 of digital technologies. And, but in terms of urban development, um, we have to consider that both parts of visible changes or the most visible changes in our cities, the digitalization of work and, and everyday life, as well as the gentrification of neighborhoods, are based on global financial investments. Yeah, and in case uh, of the new locations of global players like Google or Amazon um, in cities like Berlin or in the effect of the tourist apartment subletting business um, organized by platforms like Airbnb, we are confronted with the first examples of visible relations between new technologies and urban restructuring um, at least. And, and the case of Zalando's strategy here in Berlin to operate as a landlord in Friedrichshain to provide their international stuff with inner city accommodation um, or the case of the growing real estate investment of the um, Samwa brothers, uh, the CEOs from, from Rocket Internet are showing um, the interconnection between digital businesses and real estate speculation and quite directly and 
over all these activities are um, this, this context of, of um, financialization and then the economy of economy of financialization. The majority of people living in cities like Berlin or Barcelona maybe um, is not benefiting from these economic activities. Um, the most, as the majority of them. Of, of course, we have some benefiting by all this Airbnb businesses or or other former shared economy activities. And then gentrification became an urban mainstream in the last ten years, and most tenants have to pay higher rents than before. And it is likely that smart city projects in Berlin will boost the trend of gentrification. So this, this is the experience of, of all the Zelando and Google activities in Kreuzberg or um, the Amazon um, location um, in, in, in Charlottenburg, or is it? <laughs> so my first proposal um, is to combine critical analysis of digital technologies and gentrification so that this is of, of course, a result if you invite me to one of these discussion, and, and the housing question will be one of the strongest challenges for the future, and we should not disconnect it from discussion about digital technologies. Um, but even the aspect of progressive vision on new technologies should be related to the urban questions, and, and Francesca still presented how they done it in, 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 in Barcelona. And many social urban movements in the past as well as in the present age postulate this right to the city as, as a slogan and as a demand at least. And this right to the city has to translate into the 21st century and, um, and, and also into the conditions of financial mode of accumulation and new technologies. And the basic idea of this right to the city is going back to Henry Lefebvre's work in the 1960s and then some of you are familiar with this um, series. And um, Lefebvre defines the right to the city in the 1960s as a right to centrality and resources Second, as a right to recognition of differences and to a right to appropriate of urban surpluses extracted by collective activities in the cities. And, and if, if we read this, 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 this early discussion on right to the city, then, then we realize that, that this is, uh, this, this are, um, that, that there is also a need to, to reformulate these this claims and these demands into um, the new conflicts and, and the new situations in the city. And Evgeny and Francesca proposed in their paper a right to the digital city. And um, Francesca pointed out um, that they are claiming a lot of democratic and common alternatives to organize and to use digital technologies, open source, grassroots based infrastructures, cooperative modes of service provision, open knowledge, open data, and so on. And the paper demonstrates a wide range of possible and realistic alternatives to deal with new technologies. And if you want, you find all elements of the right to the city in, in, in Lefebvre's sense um, in, in this approach. And, and for example, open source and sharing infrastructure could be seen as a right to centrality and the right to resources or digital democracy and diversification of infrastructure and providers could be seen as a right to recognition of difference or open data, open knowledge could be a part of the rights to appropriate the surplus of knowledge based based production. So, but, um, at least by reading the, 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 the strategies in, in, in Barcelona especially, um, I, I feel that there is a limitation to the technological, technical side of the urban changes. And the vision of digital commons and shared resources, digital democracy, are more or less opportunity directed at digitally skilled activists. Yeah, and, and also here in Berlin, um, my experience is wherever you visit, um, all this urban hacker spaces or a bar camp of critical developers or a meeting of critical internet activists, you will meet highly skilled crowd, maybe like, like here in the room, um, of many young men, less women, and with their own professional roots in the digital economies. So and in terms of, of, of technological changes of production, it means that most activists of digi digital commons and right are potential beneficiaries of the new technologies. Yeah? And, and, and we, we, we should, well, maybe, this is a hypothesis. So, 
<laughs> so and, 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 and one way to escape from this elitist trap um, of anti-smart city and digital activism could be to reinforce the connection to other social movements and, and like the housing movement. And what we need is, uh, in, in, in my terms, a kind of de-gentrification of hacker space and um, technological discussions and the digitalization of anti-gentrification protests. And such kind of connection could be a precondition not only to understand the smart city policies as an attack on our cities, but as well to assemble a new generation of grassroots protests, civic organization for a right to the city. And if capitalist accumulation in the 21st century needs digital infrastructure, smart city policies, and gentrification um, to be successful, we should refuse all of them. <laughs> no, and if capitalist capitalist logic means that the cities should be reconstructed to become ready for the current mode of accommodation and the basic technology, we should try to reverse the relation between cities, technologies, and accumulation. Cities should be not longer a tool for accumulation and new infrastructure, but we should use the potential of digital technology technologies to empower people. Um, in history, city were a shelter for people and a common place for people's activities and we should reclaim cities for this function. And I, I think that, that, that the way in, in, in which the activists changing Barcelona um, by governing the cities in, in the last two years around, um, this, this is a good example um, that this is possible to, to reclaim cities' function for people's activities. And especially under the conditions of a globalized economy and exploitation, there is a need to rediscover cities as an instrument to protect people's need and to protect people's need and societies from ongoing commodification. And in, in relation to the study of Yevgeny and Francesca, it seems clear that we don't need smart city policies um, like we know them from, from our governments. And, but I'm not sure that the right to a digital city is the answer um, we need. What we need, from my perspective, are social, political, and also digital strategies and maybe smart movements um, to reinforce the right to the city. Um, but the right to the city is, is a city of, of people, it's a people city and not a digital city, at least. So this is my understanding of this, and the strategies for a right to the city cannot present it in, in, in one discussion, and it, it's not be um, the result of one study, but it um, should be a result of a wide and collaborative um, debate, and therefore I thank to Yevgeny and Francesca because um, with their work and their study, they, they offer a really good basic point and starting point for all these discussions we need to transform our cities um, with or maybe sometimes against the new technologies. So the plan was now to give you the chance to answer very shortly in five minutes. Do you think you can share the five minutes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah? Um, well, I think we agree on <laughs> most things. Uh, again, I also agree with what you said at the very end, that it should not be conceived as the right to the digital city, because even though you know, the question here really is to what extent you would like to ascribe any specificity and substance to this idea that the digital city or the smart city in itself carries any weight politically or intellectually. Because from what I've been telling you, for example, in my intervention, it does seem that the rationales that have resulted in so many cities falling for smart city policies, those rationales have a history that predates digital technology, as we know it in cities, and that is much better told or retold within the city, within the history of capitalist transformation within cities themselves. Right? So in that sense, yes, I agree we need a right to the city that will somehow not surrender the fight for decommodification or definancialization of cities. Uh, and we have to understand how the digital amplifies and how the digital accelerates many of these processes now. But I also think we have to be quite clear that 
the question of infrastructure and the question of digital infrastructure is to me a key question because you know you might call me a determinist or technological determinist or whatever you want but given the privately owned mostly you know US operated digital infrastructure that we have what you are most likely to get in cities is the paradigm of city as a service and not the right to the city Right? which means that you will get access to many of the services and activities that you previously used to associate with cities, it's just that it will be provided to you by a private player who will either charge you by the use of that particular service or who will maybe offer it for free as long as they can get your data out of it. That's the infrastructure that we are putting in place. Right? If you study the third largest startup in the world right now, which is not Uber, which is number one, Airbnb is number two, number three is WeWork, right? the company that mostly does co-working spaces. But they also do data analytics on top of co-working spaces. They describe their self-mission, if you will, their mission, their main activity is to offer space as a service. And they are the ones backed by all of the big financial funds. They are by, backed by SoftBank, which just gave them $4.4 billion. They are valued at $20 billion, which means they can go and buy up as much real estate as they want. I just saw that they struck a deal in Berlin to get a part of Potsdam Platz actually converted into a co-working space in 2018. And it's a huge space. I think it's around 13,000 square meters. And they can do that because they have a lot of money. But once they have that, that space does become operated on that logic that they have, which is space as a service and not space as a right. So the only reason why I would like us to keep thinking about the right to the digital city is precisely to problematize the question of digital infrastructures, how data fits into it, and to kind of put it front and center. Because if we do not have infrastructure under our control, then I would like to know an alternative story of what would the right to the city mean in a city where all of the real estate is owned by the services that by the firms that are then also offering all sorts of digital or technological services. So firms like we work to me is a very nice kind of in scary example in paradigm. What happens once the logic of financialization meets the logic of digitization. So problematizing the question of infrastructure thing is important and that's why I wouldn't just surrender it and kind of lump that idea into the right to the city in general. Yeah. Well can I try to be quick so um, the question of the digital, I think I give you an example why I think it's actually important to, I mean, not underestimate, not dismiss digitalization completely, like try to, I mean, be inside and understand the, the impact of it, the socioeconomic and political impact. So let's take Airbnb. So we are like on the same ground with that. So Barcelona, as you know, I mean, we have engaged in quite a frontal conflict with Airbnb. And the reason is that uh, some of these sharing economy business models, they have a very bad impact on the city, in particular if you have a, a government that is trying to make housing affordable and increase the number of public housing and the access to public housing. And so we've seen like rent increases and also the business model in particular, I mean of Airbnb in short term rental model and the platform they use is actually increasing the rent like pretty dramatically in the last years. And so, I mean, we had two main like problems. I mean, one of course is these companies don't pay taxes. And this question is related also to digitalization. I mean, not that only digital firms don't pay taxes, but this is a new model of operation and we're gonna have to deal with that. I mean, government are gonna have to be able to tax these companies where, where value is produced. And yes. And um, the second point, of course, they don't obey to local regulation. So if you say, you know, I'm a city that believes in the right to housing and I want to do all these policies, it's very hard for us to actually make sure that these companies comply. And so, you know, on, like one day, my mayor, she came to me and she's like, we realized, you know, we were sending inspectors. I mean, I hope this is not recorded. But we were sending inspectors to see <laughs> if, um, you know, if there were like empty apartments and if, you know, how long these apartments were empty with a notebook and a pen, writing literally down, you know, this building and writing it down. And we were fighting, you know, these huge data platforms, the data extractivists, sucking in all the data and creating our 
price index, mm -hmm. that it should be like publicly owned. And so it was obvious that no, we have to use this data for our collective good and we have to repurpose this kind of infrastructure for our own policies. And so it was like very obvious that we couldn't keep fighting that kind of model with pen and paper without having a digital registry and without having that kind of tools and infrastructure and without understanding how that model was impacting on the price of housing and so on. And same for Uber. And I wanted to connect this to the precariat. I mean, there is a link between our social collective condition of being precarious workers you know, intermittent, they say in France, in and off jobs, I mean, in, in the UK, they have zero hours contract and the gig economy. And this is now always like more and more obvious that these companies also have a dramatic impact on the form of labor. And so we also have to understand that and propose an alternatives. I mean, being starting with basic income and then like some future good employment for people or a form of, you know, Thinking about that is really important. And I think this also, I mean, as to, uh, it basically implies that you, you understand what is going on. So you may not call it digital, but you have to deal with the consequences of these new businesses and the implication of it. And then just finally, I reject the question of activist. I mean, just because I do not think that we're putting forward policies for activists. And I do not think that it's only about digital activists. Actually, you know, just one example. In Barcelona, you know who is using our digital platform, Decid in Barcelona, which is our democracy platform? We have statistics, so we put everything uh, op open data, so you can see the use. And it's not the digital natives, elites, um, you know, well-educated, not only. So we, we, we map the socioeconomics of the people that use it, and it's like pretty inclusive because we don't use it to determine this kind of hipster policies, but we use it for people that care about you know, employment, uh, care about housing, care about energy policies and so on, and because these are the policies they get involved. And so I think, I mean, maybe you are right with the critique, but we should really move away from that kind of, you know, this is an activist policy. I think, no, we are building, I mean, popular um, uh, propositions. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. It was a uh, big information what we get uh, now. So now the, it's the time to get uh, to give uh, your questions to these three speakers. And there's a microphone over there, and you can just raise your hands. And we will make a first round, and maybe you can uh, put very short questions so that a lot of people have the chance to ask. And then we will make two rounds, I would say. First round, then to the floor, uh, to the stage, and then back. Okay. Okay, yeah. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question. You just mentioned in the very end a platform you implemented in Barcelona, a digital platform. Yeah, just could you elaborate what that is and what you use it for and who, who is using it at ETC. Thank you. Okay, uh, maybe you can raise your hands again. I didn't saw the... Ah, yeah, okay. So there's over there and... Um, well, uh, um, one thing I, I got away from, from all, of your, uh, all of your lectures was that um, the smart city narrative, as, as we uh, know it, is, is, is essentially a, a neoliberal, um, neoliberal agenda, which is basically based on uh, austerity. So um, we have a situation that uh, cities are no longer pro uh, able to provide certain services, and uh, private uh, service providers get into this gap and uh, say, we can provide these services. So this is essentially the, the problem we have to face. Um, but on the other hand, uh, uh, oh sorry, uh, which leads us to the point that we have to make cities able again to, to provide these services. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there is essentially the question that um, these, these private service providers often can provide these services uh, at a more efficient rate. Um, by efficiency, I mean um, how much money they have to invest to get a certain service. But um, the problem with this is also that um, with this whole uh, smart city narrative, we have gotten to the point that uh, basically cities are measured by the criteria that 
private, uh, private companies are usually measured by. Um, so uh, criteria of uh, efficiency, et cetera. Um, and of course, if, if we measure cities uh, or the um, public administration in general, uh, at these criteria, they will always lose because uh, they can't uh, function at a, at a level of efficiency like a private company. So, um, but I also think this shouldn't be your main problem because they have other, uh, other advantages. Um, what is the question? Yeah, the, the question is, <laughs> uh, the question is, um, how can we, um, how can we uh, foster the appre appreciation uh, in the public for, for the advantages of the public sphere against private, uh, private service providers? Okay, because these, these uh, advantages, no, no, advantages no. are not on this the same question. level. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, in the last... Uh, hey, uh, to Francesca, maybe. Um, you talked about um, hacking EU funds uh, to build a EU digital sovereignty um, movement, maybe. And I would just be interested uh, if you could talk a little about uh, the strategies you used or you use. Yeah. Um, Airbnb is very often. Um, seen in a negative um, way. Is there any positive uh, vision of urban agenda and of residential problem um, in, in, yeah, uh, is there any way to solve these problems uh, using digital technologies? Yeah. Is, it, is it understandable what I, like square meters, how, how can they be achieved through, through digital? Uh, technology. Okay. Are there any m more questions for the first round here? There's one here. I give you. <laughs> Maybe you can. Yeah, uh, my question is um, you mentioned that it's basic to get the collected data for the society available. Do you think it's also needed to restructure the internet providing structure so that everybody of the precariat can have access to the internet? Okay, thank you. So maybe we make the first round of answers. Yeah. All right, I'll jump in. Um, so on the question of services and this is how the smart city agenda is perceived as neoliberal, again, l let me just, maybe that I'll be at my lucid point tonight when I state this. So yes, there is the smart city agenda, which is the official agenda embraced by cities, advertised at smart city expos, pitched by companies. This is layer one. Then there is layer two, which is the digital agenda, which is also partly embraced by cities, partly embraced by tech companies, and exists mostly in some kind of joint uh, enunciation, if you will, by the tech sector and the public sector. And then there is just the spillover effect of the business models pursued by big tech companies at the national level, a global level, and city level, right? And those three do not necessarily map onto each other. And what I was trying to say at the beginning is that, fine, you can imagine a future where there is no smart city agenda. So, you know, IBM doesn't pitch any more services to cities, Cisco doesn't pitch any more services to cities, and so forth, but that would not in any way lessen the dependence of cities on these firms, on the data extractivist models that they put in place, and they would not in any way somehow lessen the effect that companies like WeWork, for example, which does not even present itself as a smart city initiative, have on cities. So let's not get too fixated on the smart city agenda as such, even though it's very important, but have a broader view of what kind of effects technology companies, which at this point by and large are driven by injections of funding from the financial sector. If you look at who gives money to Airbnb, Uber, WeWork, and all the others, most of it is not even, well, increasingly, it's not even venture capital. Those are mostly sovereign wealth funds and firms like SoftBank, which take advantage of low interest rates to issue bonds, borrow money very cheaply, and then lend it to firms like WeWork, then they buy up the real estate and turn it into a service. Right? So you cannot have this analysis without having a broader analysis of where the macroeconomically capitalism is. Now, to answer your question, 
I think, again, once you move to AI-driven services, you can see that that's sort of the ultimate stand, which the public sector wouldn't, the ultimate hurdle, that the public sector wouldn't be able to overcome. Because if you think about deals, for example, that Google now offers to governments, I'm not just talking about you know, cyber security or cyber insurance, think about healthcare. So in the United Kingdom, you have this perfect example. The NHS, you know, the National Health Service, is broken in terms of cash. They really have a budgetary shortage facing them in the next 5, 10, 15 years. What do they do about it? Well, one way to solve the budgetary shortage is to invite Google, who will come in, analyze the data of all the patients, so 3 million patients or 4 million patients of the, si of the system, use AI to identify uh, advanced signs of particular disease, and then feed that sys data back into the health system so that you, know, you could take appropriate measures. And the NHS is doing that. So they are signing deals with Google, where Google will bring its AI to experiment and do things with data that will hopefully lessen the financial burden on the NHS. But here you can clearly see that the public sector at this point, in as much as they are starved out of money and do not have any access to advanced technologies, all they can do is to basically privatization on steroids, which they wouldn't call it that. They will call it digitization. So you know the deal between Google and NHS will be spinned as a digital deal and not as a privatization deal. So it's privatization through the back door of some kind. And if you really want to restore the ability of the public sector to be a player here, you really need to tackle the question of who controls access to the most important resource of the next 10, 15 years, which I'm still convinced will be some form of artificial intelligence. It does not have to be you know, civilization destroying robots that Elon Musk is worried about, but those will be systems that will produce immense savings and will manage to operate more or less autonomously. To me, it's obvious that this is where the world is going, and if we surrender control over this resource to just a handful of firms, they will be the ones dictating the terms. So I have a very bleak future for the public sector at the broad scale of things, but in some sense it's optimistic because it points you to how you can actually intervene and make things better if only you resolve that one question. Again, I don't want to be very utopian and kind of, you know, a lot of people had the same kind of critique of finance a hundred years ago where they saw that as finance take over everything, then you just need to socialize finance. So I don't have that illusion. But I do think that once we manage to resolve that question, you can actually rethink and completely reinvent what the public sector means because you actually wouldn't need exactly the same institutions as we had before and wouldn't need to keep defending them forever. So you will be able to reimagine it, make it work for citizens, perhaps with less resources, but in a way that will also promote a basic degree of democratization of what the state but also the public sector means. And I think it's a healthy agenda. Like it's not, I don't see it as ominous. Again, in as much as there is control and exercise over that resource and the data that powers it. Thank you. Well, let me build on this. Um, I think, I mean, one, one way to see this is that uh, we do actually need, uh, I mean, the state as like a description of the welfare state to provide to our social reproduction. So I do think actually there is a lot of purpose. I mean, I, and I think this explains the progressive ad agenda that we, we have now in cities across Spain, which is this idea of, um, taking back control of public institution to repurpose it for, for, for people. And I think the question really is there to, to have an alternative agenda where you on a certain point, I mean, can put pressure and avoid the fact that you will have privatization of healthcare, of education and of, of the welfare state entirely. And I think, I mean, the, even, even the question of um, artificial intelligence in itself, I mean, why the NHS needs to go into uh, a, a big agreement with DeepMind, which is the artificial intelligence branch of Alphabet, in order to mine health data, to create insights for the healthcare sector, when they know exactly that this is short-term gains, but in the long term will probably mean the privatization of the healthcare system. And also the deals are not are opaque. I mean, they're not transparent. They're not done with consciousness. So they're not explained to citizens. You know, this is what you gain. This is what you lose. And I, I, you agree. I mean, do you agree, you know, to give access to all your health data to Google according to some kind of, um, you know, terms of contract that we don't know? 
So I think, I think the question of taking back public institution is about actually reformulating a different agenda, which maybe is also having to do with why government don't also um, use, you know, take advantage of the low interest rate due to quantitative easing and invest in alternative infrastructures or, you know, tax uh, the data extractivist companies or the, the data platform and then create a fund for basic income. I mean, I think these are the kind of policies that we want to see. And to answer to the question, hacking European funding is not really hacking. European funding is our tax, I mean, is our money. So it is really about repurpose that kind of European money to invest in this type of projects. I mean, to invest in alternative digital infrastructure or alternative um, social uh, projects that we need or in a better welfare state. And so I think, I mean, some of the examples, for instance, in particular, maybe that you're referring to on digital sovereignty is there are big European projects. I mean, I've contributed to shape a program that is called um, Collective Awareness Platforms that has invested into privacy aware infrastructure, decentralized um, data management systems and, you know, bottom up kind of innovation. And I mean, it was only 60 million euros, so definitely not enough to build any robust system. But I mean, something to start from. And I think there is more and more opportunities around that. Um, then the question, I wanted to um, respond to Decidim in Barcelona. Well, it's a digital platform, it's all open source, so you can look at the code, it's published on GitHub. And we use it for democracy, for participatory democracy. So at the moment we are running um, 12 uh, participatory processes in parallel, and some have to do with cultural policies, urban planning. So for instance, one of the big uh, urban planning schemes that we have in Barcelona that is closing off part of the city to traffic, to increase, uh, to give back public space to citizens and make more green space is called Superblock. And that was drawn to, uh, through a mechanism of, of online and offline participation with citizens. And lots of the proposals are then analyzed through the platform. So I think for us, digital democracy is never a substitute to physical democracy, which means going to neighborhood, involve communities, assemblies, and all of that. But yes, that it, make it, it makes it much easier for people to participate. And then we can uh, use data visualization and analysis analyzing data to take back better decisions and uh, I mean we have mobility plan now which are done through the platform uh, we have um, the policies of um, use of specific districts which has actually have to do with common use of specific buildings and this is also discussed through the platform and uh, I mean just so you know the main agenda of the Barcelona government was done through the city in Barcelona so 70% of the actual policies that we're implementing now were citizens proposals so we used it large scale I mean more than 40,000 citizens propose ideas for the city uh, agenda to be implemented and then the access to the internet uh, as, as, as right for the precariat yes I mean I'm I'm all for um, actually Barcelona owned the fiber this is a very important thing in smart city policies I think it's very important that you get infrastructure right for instance we own 500 kilometers of fiber it's public and we also building a sensor network that are open standards and open source, like our sensor network is called Centillo. And, uh, and I think we need to move like that, you know, building data lakes which are open standards and give access to, to citizens and small companies to build on top of that. And then, um, and then I'm all for a decentralized architecture and infrastructures because I think that that is also a new model of governance that we can, we can experiment with. Um, I want to add some <laughs> some words to the discussion on, 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 on the providers, the private pro providers, or should we socialize the provision of, of internet infrastructure and, and other infrastructure. And, and of course, in, in terms of control about uh, the technologies, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it would be an, an, an important step for more, more democracy um, in our cities, um, but it would not stop the accumulation of, of the new financialized regime. And, 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 and that's because um, the, 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 highly, or the, the highest range of extraction of urban produced surplus is not going um, as, as a fee for, for the infrastructure, but it's a kind of capitalist round rent. Yeah, and, and as long we have 
a privatized structure of, of landlords and, 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 and property in our cities, um, then we will have these extractions um, from all these collective activities producing urbanity. And, and, and therefore, um, this, this controlling infrastructure um, is a good answer in, in, in terms of uh, power relation and in terms of, 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 of sovereignty and so on, but it, it would be not means the end of capitalism, at, at least, but, but this, is, this is sure. And, and, and so I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> but um, the um, appropriation of, of landlords um, would, would be a much um, stronger step into this di direction. And so I'm, I'm, I'm coming to, to the question of public infrastructure and, and, and the question how to finance this. Yeah, and then you pointed out that um, cities um, were rated after the same criteria as like um, um, private companies, so, but, but um, the financial resources to, 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 to recommunalize um, social services in, in cities or housing or, or whatever or, or technology infrastructures are not based on loans in, 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 in private financial institutions, it's based on taxation. Yeah? And when we heard that, 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 that companies like Google or Airbnb never pay a tax in our cities, yeah? or when, when we, we see that, that all this um, extracted surplus from, from property investments in housing is more or less without taxes. Yeah? Then, then I know how we can finance um, the, the budget for, for a recommunalization in, in Berlin or cities like um, Barcelona. And the second point is that, 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 of course, there are other ways to democratize um, the provision of infrastructure um, between uh, private ownership and the state. And, and this is a decentralized and community controlled um, provision of infrastructure based on, on, on a social control. And this would be a third way, and we could also um, support, especially in, in this infrastructures for the new technologies. I think that this decentralized um, perspective could be helpful. So this is now the last chance to uh, raise your hand. If you have any question, um, then we can make a last round for questions. Is there any question in the in? Ah, okay. So. Or comments. Yeah, comments as well. Sorry, comments, answers, questions. So what do you suggest for? Okay. And uh, there, the lady over there. So thank you for your perspectives. I was really happy to see that people with technical knowledge were brought together with the, 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 the knowledge uh, around gentrification and our materialist city structure uh, fights that we have. And I'm more optimistic of what we can accomplish in the concrete materialist world than we can against these massive weapons of uh, digital technologies that Powerful companies have those have those tools and can use them and uh, utilize them better than we can. So I would just like to inform everyone that um, there is a campaign to try to stop the Google campus from moving into Kreuzberg, and I encourage everyone to get involved in that because once they're in, there's many things that they can lock us into, and so it's very important to stop these things before they get a footing into your city. Um, so I would just also like to put this question out to you. If um, you think that we have more chance uh, to, to struggle against these powers, to hold these powers accountable, those who, who wield these, these massive weapons of cybernetic technology, if we have more chance to stop them on the ground in their offices uh, versus trying to create alternative platforms, because I don't think that AI, for example, can be developed by neighborhood groups. It takes massive amounts of money to do AI projects. So there we're really like, we're not empowered to, to compete with that. And things like Diaspora versus Facebook, it's like it didn't work because you have to have massive structure to do global scale communications like that and we can't compete with that either. 
So stop these things before they get us locked in to their means of um, production. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question on open data um, because as I understand, Barcelona is very much into um, um, disclosing a lot of public data you have. And I wonder, with Google collecting all the data and data being referred to as the oil of the 21st century and so on, is it really smart for cities to disclose all the data that they have about public transport, traffic, energy use, or is there perhaps a limit to that? I would be interested in your opinion. Thank you. Is there any comment? Ah, okay. There, uh, Barbara. Uh. Um, yeah, I was wondering whether if things are made um, open source and also data approaches, whether there might even be a power of cities to compete against the big ones because if we can in Berlin, for example, take up um, the, the uh, well um, experienced Barcelona projects and build on that and many cities around the world do that, um, I could see uh, quite a lot of potential. Um, and otherwise, something that might be of interest of many people around here is maybe that's not the expertise of Francesca and Yevgeny, um, but what's going on in Berlin um, in this domain. My question would be, um, how far are we away to be really independent from those big tech companies? Because actually, a city of Barcelona is still using Microsoft as an operating system, for example. So we are really thinking of the base. Um, we can do something different, but um, the, the base is always from those companies, so um, can we really catch up one day without those companies? Okay, so there's also a last question I see over there, Barbara. Yeah, I wanted to make a comment because I was a little bit worried about the distinction that Andre made about uh, like some kind of skill, uh, knowledge, uh, digital workers that actually benefit from the digitalization and all those processes, and uh, then the activists that uh, fight capitalism and how these kind of are two, uh, like two groups that should be reconciled, because in my experience in Spain, I come from Madrid, and uh, one of the things that was very, very important in the development of the squares and the camps and the thing that actually created the after a movement that lasted much more than those uh, two, three months of the camps was precisely the use of technology and the presence of the hacker and the hacker community which was embedded in, in the movement. So I don't know how is the situation in Germany, but of course uh, in Spain and maybe to a certain degree in Italy, hacker spaces and hackers have been part of the social centers and have been part of the movement. So you don't see it in something different. And uh, that means that this right to the city is a right to the uh, digital city and right to the uh, housing city and right to the open space city and right to the health city and right to the different layers that are out there, but uh, in my experience, I wouldn't put it like a two opposite. So I would even contradict Francesca in the sense that it's, it's, it's not a way that it is not a policy for activists. It's like maybe because we are embedded, and, and at least in Spain, our politics is also embedded in the digital uh, sphere, we should all become uh, activists of data the same way that in Spain, uh, at a certain degree, everybody knew if the, uh, how you say, La Prima de Riesgo was reaching 500 or not, which is this uh, complicated, uh, what? 
that the risk prime was reaching 500 or not, and everybody knew it. It was like the weather. Is the risk prime already 500 or not? Which then made everybody like a financial activist. So uh, then the question, maybe for Katalin, because you were challenged by Francesca to work on this domain, is what are the, the opportunities in Berlin to actually create uh, this link of making everybody that uses the technology uh, uh, technology activist? Should we? Um, and just a very simple question about the framing of the debate. Is there any reason not to talk about digital colonization as, as a sure. way to sort of conceptualize it? Sure. Well, I'll take just a couple. And then, uh, so I'll, I'll take the last one, which, and then the first one, and then I respond to Andre. Uh, so on digital colonization, we do discuss in the study also some of the initiatives with regards to the smart city in the global south. Not to a great lens, but there are quite a few, all of them driven by uh, very hyper-capitalist leaders with authoritarian tendencies, which, you know, Modi in India would be one of them, who is also the greatest champion of cities. So in the actual meaning of the term colonization, if you're not talking about colonization of the everyday life or whatever, you, you know, like, if we're talking in the actual sense of colonialism, actually, more than colonization, yes, you can think about ways in which many of these firms are expanding into the global south, but not in the way in which they do it here. So, you know, in, in Western Europe, North America, we're talking about cities that are already built, and there they come and tweak the infrastructure, they extract some data. In India, they're building cities from scratch. And there is, of course, a long tradition pushed by the World Bank and many other institutions of actually building fully privatized cities, right? Even before this digital money has started. So there, it really fits into that model where you do have city as a service already offered to you where garbage collection, water, electricity, basic infrastructure is already offered by private uh, companies by default from the very beginning. And there you can think about ways in which it ties to all sorts of other processes related to colonization and whatnot. So yes, you can use that framing. I just think for the global north, it might not be the best way to frame things. Uh, one thing I wanted to say on the question we heard from there how far we are into uh, resisting this global companies uh, at the city level. I think we're very far, but that should not be the reason not to do things locally, in part because at this point, the fight should happen on many different fronts. And one of those fronts should be the ideological and ideational one. You really have to show that there is a future and a, there is a kind of a possibility of a world beyond Google, Uber, and Airbnb. And the only way in which you can now do that is at the level of the city. It can be a small pilot, it can be a prototype, it might be hard to scale, you might need money to do it on a national level, but you need to be able to put those things in circulation because otherwise you'll end up with the kind of question we heard from this side, which is, was diaspora failed, so who can build an alternative to Facebook, right? And in the absence of small working effective projects that have succeeded, given their very small, less ambitious mission, that's unfortunately is the framing we'll have to accept. So, you know, I see the limitations of doing those things at the city level quite well, but I also think that without doing anything at the city level, we are completely lost. Because <laughs> if you expect that the European Commission will come and build a European alternative to Google and everything will follow from there, you're living in a dream world, right? So we have to start somewhere. We, we have at least some capacity to do things. And one last thing I just want to respond to Andre with regards to the question of, you know, to what extent it's driven by land speculation or people charging for infrastructure. Again, if you look at how capitalism works in cities, I will agree with you. Primarily, it is about speculating on land, and it's not about extracting charges for using services, or not extracting charges for using infrastructures. But the way in which capitalism works in general, like there, we cannot ignore the question of infrastructure. Increasingly, even in cities, if you look at how the sector of infrastructure as you know, a source of alternative investment has grown, where you know, more and more money from big investment asset managers goes into funding you know, parking meters, traffic lights, uh, roads, toll roads, and so forth. That is a process that has been happening for the last two decades. Digitization turbocharges that process and accelerates it. So the Internet of Things, to some extent, and the smart city, is a way to find a way to charge for services and infrastructures and usage 
of resources that were previously offered under a different model. And I will defend that you know, quite uh, explicitly because ultimately this is what the Internet of Things is. It's a way to find a way to charge for the usage of everyday objects in the urban environment that we have taken for granted. Once you build a sensor that recognizes who you are, that has a payment mechanism, and has a way to prevent you from using services, you have a system which will be able to charge and extract rent from you. And that is the model through which Cisco and all the big telcos and all the big players of IoT who do not have this data extractivist model of Google in mind are going to finance billions of dollars they are pouring into the Internet of Things. So you have two, uh, to some extent, contradictory dynamics at play. You have free stuff offered to us by Google and Facebook and many others who are interested in our data, so they give us stuff for free. But then you have this other dynamic of big IoT providers and telecoms who are building infrastructures to charge us more for, for using things. And I think we have to keep both of them in mind, but, I, and I agree that if you were just to limit this analysis to series, surely the speculation and the gentrification aspect is paramount and this is where we have to invest our energies. If you want to seriate it in the broader dynamic of capitalism, like I, I think we cannot ignore the infrastructure question. Thank you. Um, I want to take the one on data and the one why don't we build on what you're doing and try to socialize this plan and start somewhere. But first, let me say one thing about this, this hybrid strategy, I think is the, is the right approach. I mean, we are not going to be able to um, build it from scratch. We are not going to be able to build it all in cities. We really have to see it as, as an hybrid model. For instance, I mean, there are some things that cities can do quite effectively. I mean, I mean, you mentioned the operating system. We have a plan where we are transitioning to open source. Uh, I mean, which means we are mandating, you know, the use of open standards, the use of, of open source software, data sovereignty, transparent procurement, and all of that. Clearly, you don't build capacity. Uh, like that. I mean, you have to build capacity, you have to, to start creating an ecosystem, attract small companies, build it. But I, I, I'm sure that it is possible to invest a lot of resources there and you can make a lot of difference. Like for instance, now, I mean, we are, we are putting digital services on GitHub, uh, they're open source, they're, they are being reused by smaller cities that are not big as Barcelona and, and they are working. And around those projects, instead of building, I mean, we are reusing effectively cities, ma citizens' money so that other cities can build on top of that and we create communities around software projects. This is a way to go. I think the question of artificial intelligence, for instance. I mean, of course, you cannot build neighborhood projects around AI, but yes, that you can empower public institutions. I mean, I mean, we have excellent capacity. I mean, in Berlin, you actually have excellent, you know, research and development centers where you have actually very good data scientists. I mean, in Barcelona, we even have a supercomputing center. I mean, we are pouring public money into supercomputing infrastructure to do what? I mean, of course, we have to use it. I mean, then we have the question of, of course, I mean, if I'm a talented developer, I mean, the curve is very, it's like that. You know, I'm a talented developer. I go to work for Google. I earn 10 times what I earn, you know, even more. I mean, of course, earning for, from a city government, why I should stay there? Or I go to work for Facebook and Google. Of course, all our talented people, even startups, they wait to be bought by these big, gigantic companies because they cannot find decent jobs in our public research centers. Right. So this is a political question. I think we should invest into these public research centers. We need them. We need this talent. And we need to to connect them with public institutions and then also with companies. I mean, we need also robust companies that help us building this stuff. I mean, we're not going to build it like that. Uh, and so it, there is an hybrid strategy there, which I think has to be in place. And I think it's a lot what Evgeny was saying at the beginning, like a new industrial strategy or something like that. And this has to take into account that you have to reclaim part of this infrastructure for the public good. And I tell you, like, you can do the difficult stuff like re AI, or you can think about who is controlling the digital identity. 
Who is controlling the payment system? I mean, now you pay on, I mean, you, you have, um, what is the horrible uh, ID system on Apple? I mean, you pay like that. I mean, with cryptocurrency and like pay biometric payment system, I mean, this is happening already. So do you want, I mean, what kind of digital ID and payment system you wanna use to access to your government service? I think it should be decentralized, privacy aware and public. And I think we have the full capacity to do it in Europe. I mean, we, are, uh, we have all the building blocks already and we have the best privacy researchers in the world. So why don't we do it? Well, so it is possible to do that and at least reclaiming, I mean, these devices, not to give data to Google and Apple, but to build a kind of, I mean, system and infrastructure that we want. I think it's possible. I mean, you may call me utopian, but I think it's actually pretty doable. I mean, of course, it's, uh, I mean, it should be planned. Um, the question of open data, I think it's a very relevant question. I mean, I think there is a lot of way to open up resources. I mean, for instance, not all the open data should just be open like that. I mean, you can do open data with access control, meaning you s establish what kind of rules you want. I think there are specific type of data that you wanna open up with no restriction because there is absolutely no reason why this information has to be kept as a kind of government thing. I mean, it should be open, it should be accessible to all the citizens and all the companies and startups that can build value out of it. And the value, I mean, then you can decide what kind of licensing you want to apply. And you can decide to control the access to this data. So if I'm a transport company, I mean, I know if you're a big company and you're sucking in huge amount of data to build your AI system, I know that this is happening and I can establish a different relationship. I can get something back from it. I mean, I can, I can engage in data sharing and then make sure that there is public return to the type of data that you, that you access. And I mean, I, I think we should even kind of find new forms of regulation that are based on these kind of systems that are not opaque. Because my problem with, you know, the Uber and the Airbnb is that they're black boxes. So we are like, we're entering into this system that we have no idea what data goes in, goes out, and what algorithms are built on top of that. So I think really the response is that we can control the access, but it has to be um, data and algorithmic transparency because otherwise we're gonna get into a regulatory nightmare we don't know what we regulate and we don't know how to do it so I think the only way is to establish that kind of um, transparency and then of course the cryptography on top which is very important because a lot of data have personal information and I said it at the very beginning I believe people should own that data and cryptography is a tool to do that and distributed architectures also and then finally, on um, why don't we build on what your, um, the plan and other cities, I mean, yes, we are actually talking to the city of, of Berlin. A lot of resources are open source, as you said, so it is possible to start building alliances. I think in the, in the transport sector, this is very clear. I really believe, and for instance, now in, in London, Uber has been banned. And you know what, like the Transport Authority of London, which is Transport for London, they have a fantastic data infrastructure. Actually, data is an infrastructure like water, gas, you know, it's, it's a proper infrastructure architecture of the city. And they have a fantastic one API, access to all the data. They could, I mean, they can use it to build alternatives to Uber and socialize this data with other cities so that it can be done. I mean, with the impact, I mean, so you control labor standards, environmental standards, and you make it more feasible to the European system, but it can be done. So I think that cities can collaborate on these kind of projects and uh, they can build digital services that are, uh, I mean, more for the public good. They want to answer to the question of, is it possible to create the independency from all these big players um, of the new technologies? And um, knowing the, the practices in, in, in Berlin's administration, I would say the only independency is uh, um, paper-pencil activities when also the officers in, in, in the um, local administrations looking for tourist apartments in this way. So, but, but this is not the independency you mean and, and, and we want. And um, the first thing is that, that I can imagine that, that the um, trans transformation of, of the whole computer system of all administrations in Berlin, I think it's a 
biggest em employee in 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 in, in Berlin um, is is it would be a big step and, and maybe too big for for a starting point and and my opinion would be and, and this is what we can learn from Barcelona that that we should introduce um, new projects new open data platforms with new technologies and then with independent technologies yeah and then this maybe a strategy of, of, of bypassing the big system we can't change in, 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 in the next four years. So this is my um, thinking, but, but we can construct and, and, and build up a, a new infrastructure step by step and then to the um, in data infrastructure, I know that we have since 2011 um, and the rule for, for transparency and, 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 and for open data infrastructure and, and, and but it, um, the implementation of this rule is, is, is going only step by step, but for example, in, in, in terms of, of spatial-based data on, on, on urban development, housing data, and, 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 and all other spatial-based data, so we have a quite good website with a lot of information. Um, at the FIS Broker is, is the name of, of this um, website, but, but it, it's so complicated to handle this website. Yeah, I, I, I need or I, I was able to use all this data, but, but I know many people and, and never understand how this website works. So, but, but it's open data, at least, but it's um, not um, publicly usable or available. So, and, and so we, we have um, to push our government and our administration a little bit in this direction. And, 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 and when I hear what, what, what Francesca um, said, from say as from from Barcelona, then then it for for me it's it's be, well, it, it's coming clearer in, in, into my mind. So that that the situation in Barcelona means that the city itself, the administration of the cities, the government of the cities, changed the role in the conflict between people and capital, or between people and all this. Um, global providers of new technologies and, and, and the city in Barcelona is not longer the arena in which this fight between people and capital uh, is going on but, but the, the city of Barcelona decided that, that, that they transform themselves into an actor in, in, in this big play and in, 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 in the words of, of David Harvey this is a step from, from right to the city claim into the rebel city policy so that cities itself became an, an, an part of movements or the city itself became an, 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 an yeah, active actor in, in all these global um, struggles we, we observed or, or Evgeny described. And, and this is, is, is uh, or for me, this would be also the next step in, in, in many conflicts we, we have to realize in Berlin as, as well. And, and it's not only about, or in, in, the, in the field of, of new technologies, it could be also um, a role or a new role of, 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 of government and cities in, in, in housing and in many, many other social and urban conflicts. So, and, and, but, but I really like this idea so that the city itself became an active role in, in, in a social conflict and it's not a regulationary instance or the arena in which some conflicts are happened. So, I try to make it short and I would really like to say thank you that you are really staying so long and it's a very, I mean, it's really a full house here today and it's not so easy to handle. Uh, so many different issues uh, in such a short time and so many different interests. And I think what we can see uh, today is a very special part of this smart city um, discourse. It is very interdisciplinary and there are many people coming from a very technical or digital point of view looking at this uh, issue and there are also people like me or, and Andre, people from like urban researchers who look at the smart city more to the city part of the smart city term. And it's not easy to bring together these two very different uh, point of views in this 
whole uh, discussion. And um, this is what we can see in Berlin as well. Um, five years ago, the major mayor of Berlin, um, uh, Michael Müller, uh, was the, um, uh, responsible for city development uh, at this time, and he made up a new strategy, the Berlin strategy. And um, this was connected to a smart city strategy. And uh, I was uh, in university in this time and I was reading the strategy and I was wondering, okay, this is this smart city thing, what is going on? And um, the funny thing is that this, this smart city strategy never reached a point of breaking through because there were always like, let's say, people who don't really want it to be a smart city. Uh, the responsibles in the um, era in the field of city development uh, were not really ready, let's say, ready for um, being as, uh, for working uh, with this um, within this uh, smart cit uh, city strategy group, and so it came that it never really reached that point. So then we had like a smart city strategy in Berlin, which was really only made up from, let's say, technocrats. There are a lot of people who don't know that we have a smart city strategy and that Berlin wants to be the leading smart city in Europe. And um, we had like two big fails of um, um, asking for money in the, from European funds during the last two, uh, four years. So the smart city Berlin is not, it, it's more or less failed. This is not really um, um, uh, a strange thing because the city knows how to fail in different ways. So um, from, from this point of view, we can be lucky that we don't have like Cisco or um, other like IBM, um, like having a, leave, leaving a lot of money here because they cannot. The, because the project projects failed. So from this point of view, we can say now we are lucky that we don't have like data infrastructures from big uh, global tech companies now. And we now more or less um, su um, sustain the smart city hype. Because what I see in the global discussion or in international discussion, more and more uh, cities say, okay, there's a problem with this um, privatization of public infrastructures due to the era of digitalization. And um, maybe Berlin in this point uh, is really lucky that we uh, overcome this big hype of smart city and now have the chance to formulate another idea of uh, being smart in the era of digitalization. So what we do is we, uh, since one year, we tr uh, try to bring together actors uh, from different um, organizations like Netzpolitik or Open Knowledge Foundation, um, but as well um, like actors from like uh, the Right to the City movement and so on, to try to uh, form a network um, to, m to open up an alternative uh, vision for um, what can be a smart city from the bottom up, let's say. It's just a working title, uh, but let's call it the democracy city or whatever. I think what we need now is a change of perspectives because in Berlin now we are only discussing about housing, building, building, building. It's just about how can we, it's not just, the just is like, it's about how can we uh, save people for losing, from, from losing their uh, houses. And we have to really overcome this discussion um, and to widen it up, uh, to really have a proper uh, discussion about how, what do we need for our city? How do we want to develop a growing city? And this is a very, very uh, important fact. We, the Berlin is a growing city, so 
we really have now the money to invest in infrastructures and if we invest now money in infrastructures we definitely have to keep in mind that we have we are now in a new era in the 21st century and um, for this i think it would be very necessary to have like a more uh, let a, let's say a bigger network like more people like being part of this discourse and saying uh, bringing in their knowledge because what we don't really have is like the technical knowledge and um, for this um, yeah I would say uh, we are at the first steps of formulating an, uh, an alternative and um, we really have to uh, broaden up the discussion about what do how to repolitize, repoliticize the public what does the public space mean in the era of digitalization? And as well, um, I think what could be a very good thing to uh, take from the Barcelona uh, strategy is like the common fab labs. I think it's a really good thing to say, okay, this is part of uh, digital participation to give people the chance to participate in digital innovation within the uh, communal fab labs. So it's just the first steps. Tomorrow in the evening there will be another discussion with netspolitik.org uh, in the sea base and uh, we will now uh, there try to connect uh, other actors who are very much more well known about all these digital things I don't really know anything about. And uh, I'm very happy that there are other people who knows a lot of about it. Uh, and I really, really want to learn. But yes, let's say, um, uh, thank you everybody that uh, we, you were here. I think uh, we uh, learned a lot uh, today as well. I hope we uh, opened up a perspective of Con, uh, getting in contact of uh, building up networks to having an idea of a counterpart of this digital capital uh, capitalism and yes we have to talk about Airbnb and about our own precariousness and uh, so yeah we will have a, maybe a drink or two here and then thank you everybody and see you bye bye <laughs>